Before sending humans into space for exploration, the U.S. and the Soviet Union needed to know the risks and effects of space travel. Putting human lives at risk with so many uncertainties would have been potentially unethical, and perhaps more importantly at the time, losing lives would have made for very poor propaganda. Instead, the Soviets and Americans had to gather early data by sending animals, and their choices for their first proto-astronauts would ultimately reveal a great deal about each program and their futures. While the U.S. prepared to send chimpanzees, a close cousin of man, the USSR curiously opted to work with stray dogs. Plucked from the streets, a part Samoyed terrier mix named Laika was to become the first living and breathing Earth creature to orbit our planet. She would endure extensive training and a difficult journey that would forever mark her name in history, although admittedly at the highest cost. Space program physicians were concerned that some of our most basic psychological functions, like being able to swallow and pumping blood to the heart, would be impossible without the gravity we have on Earth. Many questions arose during hypothetical discussions of space travel. What would a lack of gravity mean for human organs? What would happen to astronauts' heart rates and other vital bodily systems? Would humans be able to survive in space for extended periods of time? Scientists hoped that astronaut analog animals would help resolve these concerns and other doubts. In the United States, the preferred animals of choice for space-related biomedical research were from the primate family, particularly monkeys and chimpanzees. The logic was that primates were more closely related to humans and could therefore provide the best data to model the experience of a human astronaut. The Soviets were thought to have been greatly bemused as to why the U.S. had opted for primates, given how volatile, high-strung, and difficult to control they could be. For their cosmonaut program, the Soviets opted for using dogs instead. The Soviets believed that dogs were especially well-suited to endure the long periods of inactivity they would experience in space, and most importantly, they were also easy to train and control. Among the first canine subjects for early suborbital testing was Bobik, given a common name for a dog in Russian. But Bobek had no intention of partaking in scientific discovery, and the dog ran away a few days before she was set to launch. This development sent researchers at the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Moscow into a panic. They were being pressured by the leaders of the USSR to send off the dogs as soon as possible, and a team rushed out to find a replacement for Bobek. An untrained stray dog that was roaming around was captured and named Zib a Russian acronym that in English translates to Substitute for Missing Bobik. The sudden replacement didn't matter much, as stray dogs were being chosen anyway since they were believed to be tougher and more resourceful than their pampered counterparts kept as pets. Soviet scientists thought that a stray dog would have already learned to endure harsh conditions such as hunger and cold temperatures. Additionally, Moscow was swarming with stray dogs at the time. Canine volunteers, so to speak, could be easily obtained in the Soviet capital. Training for the Soviet space dogs was everything but easy. It included spending 15 to 20 days at a time constrained in a small box that simulated being inside a tiny space capsule. To help them adjust to the confinement, they were kept in progressively smaller cages so that the cramped confines of space capsules would feel familiar during their missions. The test dogs were fitted into miniature space suits as part of their preparation. The special suits were designed to collect waste with a device designed to work for female dog anatomy, one of the reasons only female dogs were used in the space program. Female dogs were also believed to have better temperaments. Each space suit was pressurized and allowed the dogs to see out of acrylic glass bubble helmets. Other practices the space dogs had to endure included being chained and standing still for long periods of time, being placed in simulators that acted like a rocket during launch, and riding in centrifuges that simulated the high acceleration of a rocket. The dogs were also exposed to loud bangs and other noises with the purpose of preventing panicked reactions in the face of high volume of sounds at launch. According to Colin Burgess and Chris Dubbs in their book Animals in Space, 
The training for animals in the space programs of both the USSR and the US was very similar and would probably be labeled animal abuse today. One major difference between the US and Soviet animal space training programs, however, were the tasks that each expected their animals to perform. American spacecraft required that human astronauts do some of the piloting, while the Soviet cosmonauts would have controls activated from the ground. The capsule that carried Yuri Gagarin, the first Soviet in space, only had manual controls in the event of an emergency. Alan Shepard, the first American in space, had to handle dozens of switches, buttons, and levers in his capsule. This difference is one of the reasons why the United States needed to use primates in their early space flights. On the ground, the American animals were taught to move levers and press buttons in sequences that would lead to banana pellets as rewards. NASA wanted to know if the animals could perform the same tasks during spaceflight. The Soviet dogs were merely expected to be obedient and go along for the ride. Yezik and Tsigan would be the first dogs to make a suborbital flight on July 22, 1951, aboard an R-1 ballistic missile modeled after the German V-2. Both dogs were recovered unharmed after traveling at a maximum altitude of 60 miles. Jizik would perish in another suborbital flight in September 1951 with a dog named Lisa, while Tsigan was adopted as a companion dog by Soviet physicist Anatoly Blagonaravnov. At least 15 scientific flights with dogs on R-1 rockets took place between 1951 and 1956. Among them was Zib, the hapless stray that replaced Bobik, who was also placed inside a capsule and had a successful flight into orbit later in 1951. Zib was no doubt delighted to return to Earth. From 1957 to 1960, 11 recorded flights with dogs were made on the R-2A rocket series which flew to an altitude of 120 miles, and three additional flights were made to an altitude of 280 miles on R-5A rockets in 1958. Pressure to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the October Revolution in November of 1957 meant that Laika's mission would be rushed aboard the much larger R-7 rocket variant that also sent Sputnik 1 into space. Laika was a young, part Samoyed terrier mix that had been taken from the streets of Moscow. Her original name was Kudryavka, or Little Curly, but she became known internationally as Laika, which is a Russian word for several breeds of dogs similar to a husky. Laika was also known as Zhuchka, Russian for Little Bug, and Limunchik, or Lemon. The American media dubbed her Mutnik, which was a play on the words for her mutt condition, and the name of the first satellite in space, Sputnik. Laika's momentous launch took place on November 3, 1957, aboard the spacecraft Sputnik 2. To the outside world, it looked like everything with Laika's space travel had gone smoothly. The Soviets admitted that she would not return to Earth, which upset many. The tight timeline passed down by Soviet leaders meant that they were unable to design a mission to ensure her safe return. Instead, they tried to placate the public's objections by saying that Laika had survived in space for up to a week before dying peacefully. This was far from the truth, unfortunately. Laika had endured a difficult journey into space. She breathed frantically during lunch, to the point that her heart raced at triple her normal rate. Laika was in trouble shortly after launch, when Block A of the craft failed to detach, preventing a cooling fan from working. Some of the thermal insulation had also separated from the capsule, and combined, these failures raised the temperature of the cabin significantly. It's believed that Laika passed away from either overheating or panic, perhaps a combination of both. The capsule carrying Laika continued to orbit Earth 2,570 times before burning up in the atmosphere on April 4, 1958, five months after its launch. Laika became the first creature from Earth known to die in space. The conditions surrounding her death were kept secret until October 2002. However, by then there had already been some expressed remorse by the Soviets regarding the plight of Laika. Kathy Lewis, a curator at the Space History Department at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, revealed that the Soviets felt very badly about Laika 
and the other sacrifice dogs in the program. Lewis makes a point about Oleg Gazenko. He was the principal animal researcher who sent Leica into space, and would later say that sending Leica up to certain death was the, quote, one thing in his career that he had really regretted. Lewis would add that Gazenko had even brought Leica home with him at times so that she could play with his children. Gazenko himself would say the following at a Moscow press conference in 1998, quote, The more time passes, the more I'm sorry about it. We did not learn enough from the mission to justify the death of the dog. Belka and Strelka were the next two dogs that went into orbit in August 1960. Joining them on their day-long flight were a rabbit, 42 mice, and two rats. Also aboard were some flies, several plants, and fungi. All on board returned to Earth alive and well. They were the first animals to orbit and safely return back to Earth. Strelka would later have puppies, one of which was named Pushinka, and given in 1961 to President Kennedy as a gift from the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Pushinka then had four puppies of her own, with one of President Kennedy's dogs, which the president jokingly called Pupniks. Despite this gesture of cooperation between the two space powers, Kennedy's advisors reportedly advised against accepting the gift, fearing that the space dog descendant could have been implanted with a hidden spy microphone. <laughs> 